you'll find Colossians chapter 3, we'll look at one verse this morning, verse 18. The subject matter the Holy Spirit would have us consider is the preeminence of Christ in the Christian wife or grace-filled wives. Colossians 3 verse 18, it's a single verse, a truth spoken from on high into the domain of darkness, but a truth full of light. We'll read it, I want to read it two times since it's so short. Um, And I'll give just a a moment for you to find it. While you're searching and I, I hear pages still flipping, Be in prayer for our youth this week as they leave in the morning for uh, their youth camp. They're joining with several other churches of like faith. They have a great program planned. If you look at the schedule, it's um, basically from the time they wake up till around lunchtime, it's spiritual. And then they have some activities that they do throughout the afternoon. And then in the evening, they come back for some uh, spiritual uh, training again. So... David Skinner does the lion's share. In fact, he does all nearly of the planning for that. And so we're so appreciative for his work and how he invests in our youth. I have uh, two of them. One has aged out, but she's gonna be a counselor. So they love it. And we need to thank David for the amount of work he puts into that on behalf of our students. Colossians chapter three, the word of God reads, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come as a people this morning and we bow at the throne of your glory. We are imperfect, and each of us has sinned beyond our human comprehension. Sometimes even in our marriage roles. Help us this morning to hear your truth, to hear it rightly, and to change. Everything in the outside world tells us the exact opposite of what we've read here. And so we ask that you would strip us of those impurities and that you would cause our hearts to bow beneath the glory of your grace and to live as Christian wives the way you would have us and as Christian husbands the way you would have us. This is our prayer in the name of our preeminent King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Paul continues to illustrate what the preeminence of Christ looks like in specific areas of our life. Here, he focuses on the Christian wife's role in the marriage. What you will hear today will sound much different than what you are used to hearing from the fallen world system. The current political climate has made these verses controversial, very controversial. The current political climate, if it continues at the present rate, will make what I'm about to tell you illegal. That's how controversial this is becoming. Indeed, I was a guest in one Methodist church in which the pastor assured us that Paul's words here no longer apply today. But God's word doesn't change. Uh, These words apply as much today as they did in the first century. Paul understood when he wrote these words the deep-reaching consequences that dysfunctional marriage roles have on the family, on the church, and on society at large. In fact, one of the reasons the world is so dysfunctional is because they have structured their families according to man's societal standards rather than the Word of God. So to understand Paul's worldview, we must look at the context through which God chose to spring forth this sentence, a sentence of light, as I call it. 
because the world is uh, giving us only darkness. And to look at what the context was that, that, that generated this sentence, we need to look at the spiritual context, we need to look at the immediate historical context of the Apostle Paul, and then we need to look at the actual text itself. So that becomes our outline this morning. To the spiritual context, first, the wife's unique role in the marriage is rooted in the Godhead. It's rooted in the Godhead. Many people trace, many even Christians, they trace back the woman's role to the Garden of Eden at creation when she came from the man's rib. But it runs even further back in time to that. It runs into the Trinitarian Godhead. God, in His wisdom, decided to mirror the husband-wife relationship after the father-son relationship in the Godhead. Namely this, they are co-equals, but one willingly takes a subordinate role to the, uh, to the other for the greater good. Paul documents this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 16. We've looked at that in detail, but the key verse is verse 3. I'd like to read that. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every healthy marriage which respects these roles points mankind to the Trinitarian Godhead. That's why the marriage roles are so important. To the extent that we keep them, we are pointing mankind to the Trinitarian Godhead to the point that we warp those roles or redefine those roles. We are warping the Trinity and we are warping the Godhead. We are redefining it. And that's why this is such an important discussion. Second, the fall of mankind in the garden brought this issue to light in society. Prior to the fall, Eve never struggled with happily submitting to Adam. Didn't ha she just didn't struggle. After the fall, one of the woman's curses for her disobedience was, Genesis 3, verse 16, quote, Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Your desire shall be to rule over your husband, but your husband will rule over you. That's the battle. The, the next chapter clarifies what that means. God told Cain uh, something similar. Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. The word desire in both cases is the same. So women, let me just speak to your heart for a moment. It will help you to understand part of the sin curse that you bear is this innate desire to control your husband. Now, that's a provocative statement, but it's true from Scripture. I don't want to say this, I don't like say, but I have to say this, okay? Yeah. Satan was present to hear that curse, and he was present so much so that he designed a world system to inflame or draw out that desire within every woman. It's so natural to you, ladies, that oftentimes you don't even know you're doing it. We see this openly in the women's empowerment movements today, but women have struggled against this curse since ancient biblical times, really since the garden itself. For instance, Abraham's wife, Sarah, ordered him to impregnate another woman in Genesis 16. And Abraham, like Adam, his forefather, listened and submitted to the voice of his wife. It led to irreconcilable family conflict and conflict among entire nations, which extends even into the present times. Jacob's wives, Rachel and Leah, began manipulating him and ordering him to impregnate their maidservants in Genesis 30. And he, like his forefather Abraham, and like his first father Adam, obeyed his wife and submitted to the voice of his wives 
It led to a life of burning jealousy and constant conflict. We'll speak a bit on polygamy in just a moment, which is rising its ugly head again, but that was not God's design. He didn't create Adam and multiple wives. He created Adam for Eve for life. In the New Testament times, we come into the, the, those times and Paul wrote to correct the Corinthian women's defiant attitudes in 1 Corinthians 11. We made ref- reference to one of those verses Earlier, he gave the Ephesian women a parallel command to our present text in Ephesians 5. He reaffirmed that later to their pastor Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and he also felt compelled to address it to all the congregations on the island of Crete in Titus chapter 2. This isn't a one-off. This is a consistent theme within the churches in Scripture. This also lets us know the world system was designed specifically from the garden, even until now, it was designed to draw out this sin curse in women and the word of God is constantly correcting it to the congregations, the gospel congregations. Man has his own sin curse, husbands have their own sin curse, next week our time is coming. But the focus here is on the Christian wife. Now, let me say a couple of things. Number one, this text is not saying that all women are to submit to all men. It's talking within the gospel context of marriage, where at least one of the the partners in the marriage is a believer. This could get very technical. We're not going to go into all the scenarios, but this is talking about a Christian view of marriage. Second, None of the preceding material that I've presented to you suggests women are inferior in any way at all. They are not. Far from it. Women are a reflection of the relationship within the Godhead. Remember, co-equal, but one takes a willingly submissive role to the other for the greater good of the institution. We could cite countless examples, both in scripture and in life, where women acted more righteously than men. What I've sought to document from scripture is how the sin curse has troubled women since the beginning of time, and it continues to do so even this very day. The anti-Christian world system conditions women to rebel against God's design for them, especially in marriage. They say things like, it's not fair what you say, it's not equitable what you say, it's oppressive, or as one young lady declared authoritatively in my presence at a small group, quote, I'm not submitting to anyone, my husband knows who wears the pants in this family, end quote. I will share with you, after that Sunday school class was over and we discussed the scripture, she repented of those words, and rightfully so. Indeed, society feeds and fuels this spirit of rebellion, though they don't even know why. Oh, they have carefully crafted intellectual arguments rooted in superficial definitions of equality and tolerance and things like that. Yet the real reason is, They have been nursed up by a world system into which they were born to embrace the strong positions regarding empowerment. You only know what you know after all, and all they know is they were born into a society which only taught them to feed their sinful, selfish, inherited passions. That sinful world system has corrupted their reasoning faculties to the point that now they actually call good evil and evil good. Then they persecute and marginalize those who disagree with them. We have to understand as Christians what we are dealing with is much what we are dealing with here is much greater than than wives you need to correct your behavior. We are dealing with a battle against uh, our wives, a spiritual war against our wives, and it's far larger than you and I can comprehend. 
This is every wife's spiritual battle, the desire to rule over her husband. And it's a war. It's a daily war. Well, that's the spiritual context from which these words emanated now to the immediate historical context God used to bring these words to life. Uh, let me be intellectually honest with you for a moment. We, and I said this last time, that sounds strange as, as if I've been dishonest with you up to this moment, but I, I'm gonna be honest and just say this statement. We don't know intellectually we don't know if Colossae was plagued with domineering, opinionated wives. The only evidence we have there might have been some uh, issue is this sentence. What we do know is that our research in nearby Ephesus yielded some insights which might be surprising to 21st century Americans. Our 21st century perception is that women's empowerment movements are a recent political development uh, that, that came about just in the last couple of decades or so. Bruce Winter presents evidence of a new women's movement in the first century. It's a fascinating book called uh, Roman Wives, Roman Widows, The Appearance of New Women and the Pauline Communities. That movement may have emboldened women in Christian congregations, which may explain why Paul repeated this submission mandate to the congregation at Ephesus, to the congregation at Corinth, to the multiple congregations on the island of Crete, to this congregation in Colossae. And let's not forget that Peter too echoed this charge to all Christian wives dispersed throughout the, the Greek world in 1 Peter. What's more, most congregations, as the Colossae congregation, met in homes which could confuse the husband-wife role all the more. How? Well, wives normally in the first century were tasked with managing household affairs while the husband was out earning a living. That could muddy the waters when the household affairs actually became the gathering place for corporate worship. It would be easier for the husband to yield authority to his wife during worship since that was her home turf, so to speak. You don't mess with a woman's home. And when the home is the place where the, the church gathers for worship, it's a conflict of interest. It'll really test the woman's roles and the man's roles in the marriage. So we're almost to the text. Before we get there, I wanna ask a, a fundamental question, and this one's important. Why did Paul address the wife before he addressed the husband? It seems out of order. The logical place to start would be at the top of the chain of command, the husband or the head as Paul called him in uh, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3. But he begins with the wife. While we cannot say with certainty, Paul does give a hint in a later letter to Timothy, the lead pastor in Ephesus. He states there, quote, Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor, end quote. That's 1 Timothy 2, verse 14. Satan knows the easiest way to destroy a man and in essence, his family, is to work through his wife. He's no fool. He understands the game. He helped create the game. And that's why, in part, Paul addresses the wife first. In fact, God addressed the wife first every time this issue came up in Ephesus, in Corinth, in the congregations at the island of Crete, to the elect Christian wives dispersed throughout the Greek world, and here in Colossae. It's always the wife first, and then he directs comments to the husband. And we'll get to the husband next week. Now to the text. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. 
The parallel passage makes it obvious this refers to a monogamous marriage, one man, one wife, who become one flesh. That was the original design in the garden. Man corrupted it through polygamous marriages. And there are those today who are calling for polygamy to be uh, reinstated and reaccepted by Christians because the Old Testament heroes were polygamists. But if you look back at the original design, it's clear in the garden and everything after that was corrupted. Then when you look at the polygamous relationships, they're disasters. Abraham's was a disaster. Jacob's was a disaster, and God worked through that and in spite of that, but it was a disaster. So no polygamy, one man, one wife, one flesh. It's not a difficult text. Key word is submit. All scholars agree this word means to place oneself under the authority of another. Most times when it's used, it's speaking of a military term of rank where a military officer willingly uh, comes under his superior, superior officer's rank. The natural question that I suspect is rising in the Christian wife's heart is, submit in what exactly? I say the natural question because that is the fleshly nature rising up to seek exemptions or gray areas. And then stretch those gray areas until you have no black and white at all. What exactly do I submit in? Well, the parallel passage in Ephesians stipulates that you submit, quote, in everything, close quote. Uh, Ephesians 5 24 so we come to a dead end there but the counter question is why are we looking for exceptions anyway why aren't we saying God said I should submit so I'm going to submit and the answer to that question is because we still have the the relics of sin in our flesh and we just don't want to give up control we don't want to submit and it's part of the curse now, uh, uh, I almost said hopefully, uh, unhopefully, I I've offended all the women here. Let me offer the Christian wife some relief. The text states, submit as is fitting in the Lord. As is fitting in the Lord. Obviously, you would not be required to submit in anything that violates God's holy word. You would not submit if your husband asked you to commit murder, for example, of an unborn child or otherwise. Or if your life or your health were in danger, that's not fitting in the Lord to submit in that case. Or if your husband were verbally or physically abusing you, that's not fitting in the Lord. Yet this phrase, as is fitting in the Lord, speaks even deeper than exceptions. It's not speaking so much to exceptions at all, really, but to your underlying motive or desire for submitting in the first place. Your husband, imperfect as he is, is a reflection or typecast of Christ. That's how Paul presents it. Now, no one is saying he is Christ. Please don't misunderstand but he is a reflection of Christ. Paul makes it clear in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Let me read it one more time. Just, I don't want you to think I'm making things up. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ, the head of every wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. That means submitting to your husband, as John Gill says, is regarded by Christ as if it was done to himself. And the reverse is also true. Rebelling against your husband is regarded by Christ as if it was done to himself. Now, I, I just will pause here and say that is a hard curse to deal with. This is a hard truth. It's one of the reasons that I enjoy expository preaching because I never would have preached this of my own accord. I would have skipped over it and went to other places. 
but the entire word of God must be proclaimed. This is a hard truth, but it demonstrates that there are real and significant consequences for sin. We don't like to hear that, but whether we like to hear it or not, that's simply the plain reality of where we are as a fallen human race. We need to quit lying to ourselves. This is the truth. Yet it's not all bad news. You do have help, Christian wife. You have the spirit of grace within you who empowers you to submit, to submit willingly, and yes, even to submit joyfully. You can do that. You can find great liberation in doing that. It's hard, it's a fight. The flesh will rage at times and, and buck against you at times, but it is a spiritual battle. That's how we have to look at this in the spiritual context. But there is a place where you can come as a Christian wife with grace and honor and a place where you love submitting to your husband and you find your greatest joy in submitting to your husband because God has placed him over you and in submitting to him, you are submitting to the Lord Jesus Christ. That message is the exact opposite of what Satan's world teaches its women. That, that, is, that is fingernails down the chalkboard to them because that kingdom is built upon pride and dominion and the kingdom of grace is built on humility and servitude. That's why the messaging is so different and that's why one day when I preach this message, I may find myself arrested. It's coming to that. I'm no prophet, I'm no doomsday person, but look around, it's coming to that and I may live to see it. To husbands, let me say this, we ought to show a little compassion to our wives, considering what they are up against. Like us, they inherited this terrible sin curse through no fault of their own. Worse, they were born into a world system designed to exploit that sin curse within them. They were educated by an onslaught of inimical anti-Christian spiritual forces which strapped their roots in her heart from childhood. They attack her from all angles. The society educates her. The media educates her. Governments educate her. Policies educate her. Institutional structures educate her. The education system, which is run by the state, teaches her and influences her and washes her brain with these ideas. All of these things by design foster anger, resentment, jealousy, and strife. And we wonder why the divorce rate in America is over 50% and it's greater than that in the church as well. It's because it's a battle and it's much bigger than any one of us realize. Why? Because the aim of that wicked ancient serpent in the garden was to create conflict in the marriage because that conflict carries forward into society and it will begin to unravel society and congregations at their very seam. I remind you, Rome didn't fall in a day. Rome didn't fall by military opposition. Rome fell because the family unit broke down and society was destroyed over time. That's happening before our very eyes. That's happening in our country, but it's also happening in our gospel congregations. And that's why this truth is so important. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. That one little sentence could be so impactful throughout gospel congregations if our wives took it seriously and if our husbands showed them a little grace as they were coming to the knowledge of this truth. To the wife, let me frame this up in a practical way that has real life implications. I'm gonna give you about eight 
quick uh, applicational points, and I'll, I'll be quick. First, choose to embrace godly, Christ-centered submission. If the motive is, well, I have to do this because Scripture commands it, then you will be miserable. It must be, I want to do this because I've been released from slavery to sin, to self, to Satan, and to Satan's world system. And once you come to that place, only then will you find true liberation in submission. Second, understand your spiritual war. Most wars are lost due to distraction from the main battle. Each time you succeed in submission, you proclaim to the heavenly host that Christ's power in you is greater than the principalities of evil outside of you. When you fail, and you will, repent and seek forgiveness and keep moving forward. That act of seeking forgiveness also proclaims to demonic forces that their power is weakening. Every time you submit, you're showing the demons of hell that they have no grip upon you. And that's a beautiful thing. Third, reflect deeply on how much the world system has sunk its roots into your feelings, your emotions, and your opinions. Again, you had nothing to do with this. You were born into it. Yet sanctification is the process of working the world system out of your feelings, out of your emotions, and out of your opinions. What you'll find, you'll begin to see how much worldliness is in you, and you'll begin to shed those influences bit by bit. Again, husbands, we need to be patient as this process is happening. Fourth, respect your husband even if he's not always right. Boy, this may be the most difficult one of all. God chose him for you. God placed you under him and his authority. It doesn't mean he's always right, deliberate, or efficient. I'm speaking from personal experience here. I'm not always right. Your husband's probably not always right. But we have to answer to God for our own stewardship issues. Yet it's much more difficult for him to be effective if he's constantly fighting two wars simultaneously. If he's fighting the one in the spiritual realm and then one in the realm of his marriage. Take one of those wars away from him and let him lead your family and just fight the spiritual war, protect your family from those forces of evil that want to destroy it. And you'll see that your husband is a greater husband than you think he is. And he's a greater husband than you think he could be. Fifth, never forget, you are not inferior in any way. You are perfectly equal in God's image, created in God's image. Your role simply is unique. Let the illustration of the Trinitarian Godhead comfort you. You, like Christ, are fulfilling your role for a greater glorious purpose. And when you see that, uh, it will change your perspective. Sixth, think of it as pleasing to Christ. Your husband is your leader. Each time you joyfully submit to him, in reality you are submitting to Christ. Even if you know a better way, or even if you know your husband's decision will not end well, your act of submission still is honoring. We are hard-headed people, husbands are. We learn the hard way. Sometimes we got to beat our head against a wall and you got to let us do it. But let us do it. We'll find out that you were right. But let us go through a little pain and we'll remember that you were right. Often, it will have a sanctifying effect on your husband if you just let him make his own mistakes. Seventh, remember this is only temporary. I don't know what uh, we will look like in heaven or even what glorified relationships will look like. Uh, however, I do know two things which might bring you comfort. One is sin will be removed so it doesn't matter. Two, all Christian saints, men and women, will submit to our head, Jesus Christ. We all will practice submission in its purest form in heaven joyfully 
No sin will exist to corrupt it through jealousy, strife, pride, or selfish ambition. And finally, consider the grace and beauty true submission portrays. The great Baptist John Gill commented, the wife's submissive spirit makes her, quote, more comely and beautiful than broidered hair, gold, pearls, or costly array, yea, than natural favor and beauty. He's right. A, a woman who desires to come under her husband's leadership is a beautiful thing, and oh, it's so hard to find. That message is the message from Scripture, from Genesis, running through Colossae, even into the present times. The world hates it. The world has an exactly opposite message. And these things, as I mentioned one day, could uh, get all of us in real trouble. But I say again with the apostle, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And I'll close my mouth until next week. Let's pray.